Eileen, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me here. I'm excited. I like to start all my podcasts by asking my guests to introduce themselves. So can you introduce yourself uh, and talk a little bit about your role and then we'll unpack that as we go. Sounds great. Uh, so my name, I mean Goldfine, I am at Heinz Interests, uh, the uh, real estate firm, privately held real estate firm. We are in 30 countries currently across um, every asset type, pretty much buy, sell, manage, do what, whatever we can do across real estate. I've been here uh, quite a while in a variety of different roles. My current role right now is uh, Senior Vice President, Chief Digital Strategy Officer which still does not roll off the tongue, and I need to work on that. But I've been in this role now for about uh, just almost a year and a half, and we can talk about how I got here when you're, when you're ready to. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm ready. So let's dive in. You've, you you, and I have had the privilege of knowing each other for many, many years now. Um, maybe, you know, talk about the the journey that you've had at Heinz, you know, over the last, I think your LinkedIn says 16 years, but you were just telling me it's closer to 25. So let's talk about kind of what is, what is Eileen's journey at Heinz look like so far? And then we'll get into what is the role that you're doing today and the impact that you're having. Sounds great. So the journey actually really makes a difference about my role today, right? And and it all comes together to get to the get to the role today, so that it is actually uh, really important to understand kind of where I came from. So I started in January of 1998 because I am old. We've discussed that before. Uh, January 1998 um, at buildings in uh, Detroit, and so they we actually were doing the redevelopment of uh, GM Global headquarters in Detroit. Heinz was working on that, as well as Heinz had some uh, other buildings in, in Detroit. I started as an accountant. And the, basically all I could do was learn as much as possible, as quickly as possible about building operations, right? And, you know, talking to engineers and we were, we were, um, you know, working with property managers, all that's about how the buildings, how the buildings were run. At the same time, it was um, a major redevelopment with General Motors. So it was, I'd say this was mixed use before mixed use was even in, right? I mean, you had hotel and office and storage and retail and y- you name it. So, uh, I started on the ground at, in building operations, which to me laid the groundwork for everything that, and everywhere that, that I've been today. And uh, after that, I moved and I, like I said, I, I started in accounting and I moved from there to uh, San Francisco and was the controller of one of our funds. So I moved into from building operations accounting to fund management accounting, right? And so I was um, working on one of our largest funds at the time, a discretionary fund, and uh, really seeing how all of the, the building operation, all the building information came up into the fund. Again, Heinz, um, we're, we're privately held. We, we do everything related to real estate, including operator-owned buildings, right? So vertically integrated. Um, so vertically integrated, investment management, all comes together. So I did that for a while. And then I moved um, into some central roles and helped start up some other funds. Our, our first uh, U.S. core fund that went into the, our uh, REIT, our, our um, products and the series of products. And so all kind of in the accounting bent, but with all this, it was um, how to do things better, faster, easier, right? So I joke around that I was constantly trying to work myself out of a job. What could I do to lay the groundwork to, to do all that? After that, I uh, moved into um, uh, a role of creating a centralized accounting organization. We did that for, for a little while related to uh, some of these fun, fun uh, projects. Then got into special projects, launching the ERP system. Again, you name it, I was into it. So. Um, I pretty much just never said no to an opportunity here at Heinz. That um, ultimately led me to move into actually into investment management. I got out of accounting. Okay, so now I've done you know accounting for various parts of the organization. I get into investment management now. I'm working on the investment management side of the house with our um, with our funds, and then that led me to where the precursor to this role, which was the the launch of the business technology group, um, and that really was I was asked around eight or nine years ago, to wake up every day thinking about how to do things better. So since that was pretty much my MO from day one, again, working myself out of a job, it was, you know, how do you put the infrastructure in place? What do you do to do things, you know, from a more efficient efficient standpoint? So that was the start of uh, the journey I'm on now. We started with myself and one other person that, that grew because what it was was looking at how to service the business from a business perspective of using tools, technology, data in order to further the business. So um, 
it, it, so this is a really pivotal moment, and I'm going to say about nine or ten years ago, because that's actually when kind of the prop tech really started coming alive, right? And so prior to that, everything that I've been doing was based on, you know, Excel or based on certain things. But that moment was when uh, prop tech starts popping up, data is, is you know, starting its journey, you know, all, all these sorts of things. So we were able to, to do, you know, quite a bit at that time. That's where we started our uh, data warehouse project. That's where we really made a lot of traction in a lot of different, different areas. And that led to then um, what we did is... August, no, sorry, April of 2022, which has launched the Global Digital Strategy Office. And what that is, is it's the, uh, the three disparate groups coming together of business process plus technology plus data to uh, really further the, the firm's objectives as well as, honestly, the objectives of real estate to make things easier, more transparent, use data to do you know, better decision making and all that. So that's my that, that's that's fascinating. Cool. I, I mean, I love I love the part of, you know, you started your career in the asset, then you were a fund controller, and now you're doing, you know, effectively, you know, digital transformation, business transformation, you know, and, and a lot of other uh, important things. It sounds very encompassing, business process, technology, data. What is it not? Like, what is, you know, either what, maybe you can answer the question however you want, either what is in your remit or what is not in your remit, whichever is easier to answer, because uh, it sounds like it's a it's a very um, kind of all-encompassing type role. Um, it is pretty much all-encompassing. So I'm trying to figure out what's not in our remit. <laughs> it's, um, you know, especially in today's world where data and technology are everything, right? Okay, so... Uh, there, there's a lot. Um, you know, we are not, we are, we are not. Um, I guess trying to boil the ocean and do everything everywhere all at once. I will use that reference. Okay, but be very mindful about how we do things. But it is pretty much the whole gamut at Heinz, right? So we have uh, reorganized the Global Digital Strategy Office. Um, when, when we put it together, we reorganized along what I call business lines. So um, we have a group that's focused on our development and operations business because that's, you know, a, a heavy business that Heinz is in uh, from a vertical integration standpoint. We have a group that focuses on our investment management business, right, from really the funds or the, you know, buying and selling of assets. We have a group that focuses on our corporate business. So um, what, you know, corporate systems we're using for HR or for employee reporting, um, for our marketing and communications. Uh, we have then a group that's basically solely focused what I call on digital transformation, which are those kind of big, ugly, hairy things that go across the entire organization that we need to figure out and kind of parse out. So right now that's, you know, ESG, that's, you know, how we kind of built a corporate um, system for our investment committee, you know, and things like that. So so really it's it's pretty, pretty broad. Um, it's pretty deep. And so, um, and we, we believe that all of this ties together, right? And so all of this needs to come together. All of the data needs to come together. And so really we've got to, uh, we've got to look at it holistically. Again, we might not boil the ocean all at the same time, but we have to look at it holistically in order to move, move. I, what I would say is the industry forward. Yeah. And so um, you mentioned when you started the team, I think you said it was two people, if I'm not mistaken. What is the kind of the, the organization that you lead look like today from a, um, you know, headcount perspective, you know, key roles and responsibilities that that kind of roll up under under your department, uh, just to give us that perspective? So when I started, that was just the business process, or I'd say the business technology groups. So that was two of us. Okay. Um, that there was still an IT organization. There was... Um, there was not a data organization yet. There was a research organization, and then that split off, and Adam Hastings split off and created the data the data organization. So it's not really an apples to apples comparison. The business process group themselves right now is about, um, I think we're about fifteen. I, I think it's kind of grown, you know, over this time, but not exponentially. Um, we we really uh, ramped up in the data and technology side because of the changes that have been happening, you know, so so rapidly. Um, we, we, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty big group, but, um, it's probably not as large as people would think that we need to have <laughs> for, the, for the size of our organization. So, um, we have about 4,500 employees worldwide. Like I said, in 30 countries, every product type, um, we do, like I said, build, buy, manage, third party manage. And, uh, our organization, the GDSO organization is probably about 100 people right now. And uh, and we're we're going as as fast as possible. 
So, so is it so in your in your bio it says that you're responsible for quote providing technology and data to empower employees. Would in in you know. I guess with that, would you say that your primary quote unquote client or kind of the people you're building for, is it, is it kind of the employees? Is it high ends more broadly? You know, kind of, how do you think about who your team is working, you know, who your partners are at the organization? We say empower employees, but that's because the employees then are on the ground they're doing the really usually doing the work for the investors or for the clients, you know, in the buildings and, and things like that, right. For the, I'm going to say the, the occupant, you know, the person that's sitting at, at the desk in the building and all that. So when we say empower employees, it's to give them the tools to be more effective in everything that they do. Okay. So that they can be, you know, really in our minds, um, you know, bringing their best uh, thought, you know, and their best uh, energy to servicing, you know, all of the stakeholders that we service, not necessarily having to work through like, you know, I've done 10 steps to get to, to get to something, right? So we really want um, our folks to be able to bring their best selves to bear, to service our, our clients and investors and all that. So that's how we empower the employees. But holistically, um, we believe, you know, our, our clients are anyone that we touch. Okay. So it's our employees, you know, in the organization, it's all of our investors. You know, we, we spend a lot of time with our investors and have conversations with our investors from the GDSO group. Um, we have uh, clients, uh, tenants, you know, occupants and things like that that we, we service. Again, that's our, that's who we're servicing, right? Anybody that's in our ecosystem, be vendors, be partners and all that. That's, um, it's, it's really all about the customer service of the entire ecosystem and how to make it easier. And so, uh, especially like I say, investors and with occupants right now, we, we need, the real estate industry in general needs to do better on giving information to those to those teams, right? I keep saying to open up the pipes, to open up the pipes to the users, to the tenants, to the investors, um, I, you know, to the lenders, you name it. And so that's holistically the way that we, we see it. They're all of our stakeholders. So I love I love what you said about the ecosystem and opening up the pipes. We're going to come back to both of those as we move into the kind of technology uh, portion of the conversation. Before we leave kind of the high ends in your career journey, for you know those listening to the podcast who aren't familiar with Heinz, you know one of if not the largest real estate company in the world, as Eileen mentioned, you know very broad in terms of the activities. But one of the things that those of us who are in the industry know and respect about Heinz is the culture. And you've been at the organization for 25 years. Can you talk to us a little bit about kind of what makes Heinz such a special place to, you know, build a career to 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 stay and and work at and and you know all the different things that yeah I mean we don't need to talk about all of them but what are some of the different things about your culture that you think are unique and that's kept you there for for so long? Absolutely, and I'll also explain why there's a gap between the 25 years and I think 16 years that it says on LinkedIn, but it also speaks to the speaks to the culture. So the Heinz culture is a and I, I referenced it before, it's really about bringing your best self to work, okay? And that best self is then working with other people bringing their best selves. So it is a constant state of um, learning and a constant state of, of really pushing yourself to be to be better, okay? And, and for me, that is just, I mean, to wake up every day and be able to come to an organization that you know that you're going to learn something new. I mean, literally every day I learn something new. You know, and, I, and there's not a lot of people that are saying that after you know 25 years in the organization. But you're you're here and you're challenged and you are working with people that are like mindedness to challenge. Right? It's it's never the status quo. Um, there's a lot of uh, quotes and things like that out in the in the in the world about Mr. Hines and about his view on innovation and his view on you know, constantly pushing and all that. That's, in, that is through and through the culture of, of Heinz, which is we are, we are always going to push. We're always going to challenge ourselves. We're always going to learn. There's always something to take away from somebody else, right? And so people that come to Heinz stay at Heinz a very long time because that is an energizing, exciting, you know, great place to be, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, you can, you can, teach other people, you can learn from other people, you can forge paths. I mean, 
what are the companies, would it be that I've been able to start as a, you know, CPA sitting in Detroit and now I'm sitting here kind of where I'm at. And that's a, that's the organization, which is to really enable all of us to, uh, to literally chart our paths and be able to, uh, you know, grow and, and just work in a way that I, I don't think a lot of other companies, you know, allow for. That said is, it's also probably, you know, your biggest strength is also your biggest weakness sometime, right? So we are a very consensus building, you know, decentralized organization, and everybody has these voices. Everybody has these opinions. Everybody has, um, you know, something to bring to bear. That's hard when you're trying to roll out, you know, maybe some consistent things and stuff like that. We'll get into that. But I always say, I'm like, if my voice matters to other people about certain things, then we need to make sure that their voice matters to us when we're, when we're doing something. So, um, so it's great. But, and I will tell you, so the difference in the, the time frames about my, the LinkedIn, the 16 and the 25. So I was working for Heinz. I, uh, moved around for some personal reasons, right? And basically I was, uh, back in Detroit working for Heinz remotely before remote work was in. Okay. And, uh, so we basically didn't call that you know, an employment, like an employee arrangement because it was new to everybody, right? I mean, this is just probably, it was 16, 18 years ago that that wasn't normal, okay? So I was working remotely from Detroit, but here for, for the uh, uh, Houston organization, the central organization, uh, investment management. And so that's a great thing. I mean, think about that just from a culture perspective, like that's way before anybody, <laughs> anybody was doing that, right? And so I was allowed to do that. I was allowed to, again, that was a lot about balancing, you know, my work life uh, situation at the time, which, by the way, I don't think there's ever balance, but it was literally a, a, an attempt to. Um, and uh, and Heinz and, and allowed me to do that. And that says a lot, again, about the about the organization and the culture. Yeah. My, my own anecdote about Heinz, in addition to, you know, uh, having the opportunity to work with you and, and your colleagues, um, is I remember many years ago, I had the privilege of, of being at Mr. Heinz's house, um, who's no longer with us, but his legacy is. And, you know, it was a room full of very senior real estate executives, a who's who of real estate. We were there for a ULI event and he was graciously hosting. And, and kind of two, two quick anecdotes. Every, you know, I was the youngest person in the room probably by 15 years. And I was the first person he walked up to and he didn't care about any of the other people who were, you know, not his peers, but other executives. But he wanted to talk to me once he learned that I had lived in Asia. He wanted to talk about Shanghai. He wanted to talk about your projects and he just went straight to it. And then much to the surprise of everybody we were with, the very next morning at 7 a.m., Mr. Hines shows up to go on the boat tour at the Port of Houston, not because he had never seen the port of Houston or there's anything that, you know, he doesn't know about Houston. But what he said to the group was he wanted to hear how the port is talking about the port of Houston to others. And that kind of shows that learners, I mean, he was, I don't know, 92 at the time ish. Um, and still going, you know, still, still going out, taking boat tours, walking the, you know, walking the assets in the, in the infrastructure. And I think, you know, to me, that's something that I'll never forget. And candidly had a big impact on my career to see people like him embracing, um, you know, people, regardless of their tenure, really just for what they have in their head versus, you know, the title they have on their name tag. Absolutely. And that's, that's, that explains our culture, our culture, you know, perfectly. And, uh, and anybody who comes in interviews or, or anything like that at Heinz, I just say, you, know, you come in and just listen to people and learn and, you know, and, and it doesn't matter again, in the whole ecosystem, you're going to learn something, you know, and you really need to be able to, to embrace that. And the people that, that do that and embrace that, I mean, we've all been around a long time. <laughs> so. Yeah, I love that. All right. Well, we've got a lot to talk about with technology and real estate. So you mentioned, you know, when your role was originally set up, you know, going back nine, 10 years ago, you know, that was kind of the beginning of prop tech. T talk to me about, you know, how do you define prop tech? And by the way, I don't like that word. So if you like it, feel free to use it. If you don't, I won't be offended. But I think about technology and real estate and the intersection of the two. So kind of like through your lens, where are we? Like, what does that landscape look like? How has it evolved so far throughout your career? So I think that when uh, real estate technology first showed up, okay, um, it showed up and it was, I, I mean, it was like this novel concept. I mean, right, we didn't have anything, okay? And so literally there was a lot of low-hanging fruit of, okay, well, this will just help somewhere do something, okay? And so and we started, we started looking at those sorts of things. And they were important and they mattered because it actually, in my mind, started everybody thinking that 
technology could apply to real estate. Okay, that this actually starts the journey, right? And so you, um, and, and what, no matter what those tools are, okay, whether related to investment management or related to, you know, buildings or, you know, whatever you want to say, those tools really open up the, the idea that technology could, could apply, you know, in, to this enormous asset class, okay? Um, I think what's happened personally over these past nine or 10 years is then it got stagnant for a while, okay, right? And it got really stagnant. And honestly, at some point, uh, I think that technology industry basically was like, well, if that all worked, then I'm going to start kind of throwing some other things out there, right? I'm going to, what about this? What about this? What this? And then there was this shift that it was, well, things are coming that nobody really needs, okay? And I think, Brandon, you've heard me talk about this a lot, about like, you know, I need to find things that give me a return on my investment that are easy to implement. Okay. That's kind of, I use an X and a Y axis to discuss this. And I need to be in the upper right quadrant. And the return on investment doesn't mean, you know, actual dollars. I mean, it could be, you know, savings of people's time so they can do something that's more, more valuable, you know, things like that. And so, um, and, and what ended up happening was we were getting flooded with a lot of things that weren't on that scale. Right. So there are, you know, maybe if you can do a bank rec from 15 minutes to 10 minutes, yeah, that's nice. But that's not, you know, that's not what we're really talking about here. Things that need it, right? And so I think personally, this is just mine, is that the industry got a bit stagnant, okay? And I think that um, also technology vendors didn't necessarily listen to the real estate, okay, and to the real estate industry. I think we're coming out, you know, and there's, there's a... I'm very optimistic there's another side that, that's coming forward here, which is, wait a minute, okay, what are the real pain points? What are the what are the things? And a lot of them are tied to the end user of the real estate, again, being, is it a resident? Is it an, you know, an occupant? Is it, you know, of an office space, of a somebody that's walking through a retail space and all that kind of stuff? And that's really, if you think about it, isn't that what we're all supposed to be doing, is looking at what does the customer really need, right? And so I think that um, I think that technology industry is is morphing. I think it's it's not perfect right now, but I think it's getting there. Which is let's listen to what the real estate owners want. Um, let's all be talking about what the end users, whether you know, it's, it's the people sitting in the real estate, because ultimately that's what drives investment returns. That drive, I mean, right? Empty buildings doesn't drive investment returns, you know, and, that, and things like that. And so. How do we, um, and, and really, so I see this shift in real estate and I think on the technology side, I'm, I'm very optimistic of where, where it is. Um, one of the other things that I would say that I've, I'm kind of watching and seeing, and again, these are just all my opinions, I'm just kind of go on record there, which is, you know, I get it that a lot of, um, companies, the UI, like that experience, is really important. And again, at the beginning also, it was really important because we had nothing, right? I mean, hey, oh, look, that's shiny. That's, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, and, and that's, that, that's important. But underlying that, how the data and how the architecture of those technologies may not have been, may not have been ideal. Okay. Because of, um, again, 10 years ago, nine, 10 years ago, it was kind of start of journey and all that stuff. And now what you're seeing is, well, again, UI is very important. The data and the architecture is the name of the game, right? If you don't have that foundation that is easily scalable from a technology vendor perspective, it is horrible, okay? Because I can't then get what we need out of it, again, from a data perspective, right? So you're kind of looking at these in, in multiple ways. So I think what you're going to see is companies that have really invested in that structure, and in that foundation, um, I think you're going to see them accelerating at a greater rate than some of the others. And I think some of the other ones are, are, need to retool and, and all that in order to get there. So that's my high level opinion of, of kind of what's going on. Yeah. So what are some of the pain points that you know you at Heinz are trying to solve as it relates to the end user? And you know, obviously, we're recording this in August of 2023. You know, we're uh, you know, we're still reeling from 
you know, some of the economic chaos that's, you know, been created over the last 24 months. Are you in office? Are you not in office? Retail is alive. It's dead. You know, industrial is booming. Development is, you know, coming back online. Like what, what, you know, with your global footprint, kind of what are some of those end user experiences that you're prioritizing for the Heinz business? Yeah, so for us, and it's, it's actually not a change now than it was before, right? Okay. So it's, it's always about the user of the real estate. It's always about the owner. Of the, like it's honestly always been about that. Okay. What's interesting is the, the changing needs of what they want. Okay. Right. So if you think about it, what's happened over time is that they've, you know, they've all wanted more flexibility, more options, more convenience, more of all these sorts of things. Right. And so I, I wouldn't say that, you know, that Heinz has, has changed its viewpoint on servicing them. It's the expectations of those users, right? Um, and even the investors, again, I'm talking about data and things like that. It's the expectation of these stakeholders that has morphed and changed in a, in a very rapid way, right? Um, very, very rapid way. And I think it's only, that's only going to continue. Well, what's an, what's, what's an example, just, just before we go on, what's an example? Like, is there any example? Is there an example that you can share? So I'm going to split it out, you know, there's end users of real estate, right? Again, occupant, you know, or um, resident, all that, and then investors, okay? I want to give it, let me start with investors first, right? So X amount of years ago, investors wanted quarterly reports, right? And they want a quarterly report, here's my asset, this is what's happening, this and this, and and all that. Um, Then they kind of started talking about data, you know, and, and, and things like that. But again, it was still probably around cash flows and how the investment was performing and things like that. Maybe they'd want to see, um, you know, something related to, you know, accounts receivable, you know, things like that. Well, these investors now want specific data related to their properties. Okay. And their properties, you know, a lot of it started in COVID, of course, around AR and, you know, what was happening, not happening. But they, they want data related to how they're going to be meeting their carbon objectives. They want data related to understanding their tenant mixes, so that they know where they have a concentration of risk. They want all this data, okay, that wasn't, again, I'm gonna go back to pipes, in the pipes before to, to get to them, or wasn't necessarily being reported to them because they didn't, they didn't act, they didn't, that wasn't of interest to them, okay? It's not that we couldn't do it, but it wasn't of interest. So you're talking, that's something that they want, and they want it faster, and they want it in a way that they can consume it. They don't want it, you know, like to go type some things and all that. So that's the investors. If you're talking about the end users of real estate, right, their whole lives have been around, um, morphed and changed and everything around the, the phone, right? And around the convenience factor of getting things um, instantaneously, right? Okay. Or having things be more seamless, right? I mean, the way that we can all, I mean, let's go around. I hate grocery shopping. The fact that I can order it online. And it shows up, you know, and I can, <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. So, so now the expectation of a occupant coming into an office building, okay? And I, we do believe in office, strongly believe in office here. The occupant coming into an office building, they don't want to have to go through 10 different gates and I've got six different badges and I've got blah, 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 and I've got this and this and all that kind of stuff. And that's just in one building, okay? But now apply that across other buildings is, wait a minute, if I'm in, a company, a worldwide company, wait, I've got these, but then I've got to send a guest over to, to that one and they have to call the security and I got to get them on the list and I've got to go do this and do this. So that's why you see all of this push related to, you know, the kind of visitor management and access and all that because it is insane, right? I mean, so, so a company's personal, you know, experience is different asset to asset. It's different getting into the asset to getting to the floor. I mean, so that convenience, that seamlessness has just not been there at all. So that expectation is, well, that should change, right? Things, things like that. I mean, there's a million other examples like that, but that's a, that's a very real thing. Yeah, no, I think that the, the tenant, the tenant experience, and it's funny, we on a different podcast episode that some of the listeners may remember, we talked about kind of not necessarily exactly as you've described it from, you know, the company's perspective or the employee, but just, you know, how the building presents itself as being approachable or not approachable and all those access points and the things that somebody needs to go through to access the fortress that sits in the sky 
those bar- those bars and barriers need to start to come down. And um, I totally understand that. So, so you talked a little bit about the investors end user experience as a pain point and how that's changed. You talked about the tenant or you know the the occupant and company's end user experience. Um, let's talk a little bit about the piping, right? Because all of this is only possible if the data is in the pipes, and then if it's in the pipes, you got to get the pipes all connected. So, how do you? You mentioned the word data warehouse before. I think some of our listeners may be generally familiar, but Maybe let's talk about like what is the infrastructure under the operation look like from a, a data architecture organization perspective as you're thinking about all the different pipes and the connections that need to exist. So um, first, let's go on record. I'm not a technologist, but I'm not a quant, so I might you know play one on TV. So I'm not going to get into kind of all the, uh, the too many of the very specific details. But nor, nor am I. So you're in good hands because my ability <laughs> to go deep on these topics is limited we're, contrary we're to what people may believe. Yeah, we're, we're so, aligned. So this, this is the way that I see it is that, so we have built a data warehouse, okay, to start connecting the data in ways to deliver it to other people, but also to see how the data is, um, what the trends and what the information is coming together when you connect it, okay? Meaning, you know, you can go use a system to catalog all of your debt and all of the, those sorts of things. You can go use a system to catalog, you know, all of your leases. You can use a system to catalog all of your accounting, right? Um, and well, that, but if you put that all together, okay, what does that tell you, right? And what are you seeing? So there's going to be some trends that you start seeing related to um, if leasing is doing this and the debt is doing this, this might mean this, right? Or when you can start putting this in ways that you're like, wait a minute, we can bounce this up against some of our research models and what does this do and not do. So putting the data warehouse together and starting to put it all together starts giving us those trends and those insights that we can use, you know, for us to run our our business um, differently, but also to be able to go communicate with, again, our stakeholders, our investors, our clients, our, you know, end users to say, maybe this is some things that you want to think about, right? Maybe this helps you make some different decisions on how you are looking at space that you want to lease, right? Maybe this and all that stuff. So, so the way that we see the data warehouse is, it's pulling these things together, you know, since since we do have a large portfolio and since it does go back a, a very, very long time, how to see those insights to provide them, again, not just for us internally, but really to be able to, you know, share a lot of those things with our with our um, clients and our, and our stakeholders. And so um, once you have that, then you start saying, okay, well, how can I deliver that to other people? You can do dashboards, you can do things like that. But again, some of these folks want this information themselves to be able to run their own businesses. And um, and I'm going to focus back on ESG, right? Okay. And back to carbon, right? You have investors that are making, you know, their own net zero targets commitments. You have tenants that are making their own. Well, how, how do they accomplish those goals? How do they know they're accomplishing those goals? The only way is to be able to give them the data that's happening at these properties and funneling it to them. And so that's really where we see um, the data warehouse and things that we're doing all the way down to the asset level coming together so that we can start ensuring that those folks can get that data in ways that they can consume it and achieve their their you know goals that your organizations have set out. So broad strokes, what are some of the kind of inputs to the data warehouse? It sounds like there's asset data, we can start there. What are some of the other kind of like major data groupings that feed in? So um, we we consider, first of all, um, one of the core tenants of our data warehouse is that um, we treat our data as one of our most valuable assets. We've got employees are a valuable asset. We've got, you know, buildings are assets, our, you know, clients, investors, but we, we um, across the organization, have have a stated goal that data is is one of our assets, not in a mission statement or things like that, but it's, you know that's a fundamental principle. So um, with that, we consider that there's right now four pillars of in our data strategy, right in our data house, um, and and we're lucky because of our organization and because we do investment management and we are vertically integrated that we can get to these four pillars, you know. I'm not going to say easily because none of this is easy related to data. So the first is external data, right? And whether that's data related to markets, whether that's data related to, um, you know, 
walking scores, whether that's data, you know, really related to anything external to our organization. Okay, that's kind of one of our, our pillars and how does that feed in. Um, the next pillar is uh, what we consider our internal financial information, right? And this means like, you know, cash flow information, valuation information, information we're making assumptions on um, from our annual plan, you know, all, all those sorts of things relate to financial information. And that also includes debt, right? That includes, um, some, you know, leasing information. That includes some some things, um, you know, related to, uh, you know, probability analysis, things like that on internal kind of financial. Um, and so, and maybe I would say leasing right there. I would say, you know, more kind of acquisition, disposition, and, and probabilities and things like that. The third pillar is what we consider operational data, okay? That's operations of the actual, you know, real estate, okay? So whether that's development information and cost information, whether that's, you know, uh, rent rolls, OPEX, you know, at a building, whether that's leasing information, that's the financial, that's the, you know, operational data of running um, that, that part of the organization. And then the fourth pillar is uh, customer experience, kind of this, you know, this granular data related to um, how occupants are using space, how the buildings are, are really connecting with um, with those occupants, right? And and that to us is, is the fourth pillar. And, and we've had that fourth pillar there for a while and hadn't necessarily delved into it for a few reasons. One, because, um, and I say a while, I mean like, you know, five or six years was, okay, what are the use cases around that? What's the value proposition? You know, you don't want to go get data just for data's sake. You need to think strongly about what are you going to do with it? How is it going to fit in the ecosystem and all that? But then also it's taken a while because the technology has not been there to get that data out. Okay. And now it finally is moving that direction. It's not, this is tough, really, really tough, but there is more access to that data. There is some more information. There are more things we can do to get that data is coming in. So that's, I would say, holistically how we see our, our, our data ecosystem. There's a lot under there. There's a lot of details under there, but I think that's kind of generally. Yeah. And we, and we won't obviously have time to go into all of them or most of them, but one of the, you know, I'm hoping maybe you can share some advice or wisdom based on your experience. Cause I can imagine a lot of listeners right now are, you know, kind of rolling their eyes um, saying, you know, not at what you're saying, but they're saying, Eileen, you know, th this is great, but you know, here I am, I have, you know, a fraction to none of the resources that a group like Heinz has. I understand everything that you're saying. I believe in it, but I just don't know where to get started. You know, I actually had this conversation last week with a much smaller, much, much smaller private equity firm. And they're like, you know, do I need to go pay a consultant millions of dollars to tell me, you know, what I would need to do to spend many, many millions more? And maybe the answer is yes, but I think I'm hoping you might have some advice for people in terms of as you're thinking about approaching data, data architecture, data warehouses, as you're thinking about building those pipes, like what are some of the things that you can do or that one can do to kind of like break down the, the mental barriers of the magnitude of some of these projects? So, so it's, it's a it's a great question, and and we're here because it's, we've been on this journey for a while, right? We're we're not here. I'm not saying all this because this has happened overnight, right? And what we did was we've actually been doing it in a very methodical way, okay? And um and because if you try to go do it all at once, you're gonna fail, okay? Um, as well as it's completely and totally overwhelming. That there's there's no doubt about it. So we always joke around like, don't try to go eat the whole elephant, which is a horrific statement. I'm not going to go that But but anyway, so so we started and said we are starting at the asset, and at the asset we're starting with cash flows. Okay, so literally that's where we started. And we said pick a date, how far you want to go back, and basically say what's the process to go get this information on a regular basis. So you can normalize it and bring it in and have the asset. Okay. That's where we started. And then we kind of went up with the asset and said to get to investor information. We went sideways on the asset and started saying, okay, I need projected information or I need underwritten information. But, and then we started going deeper in, in the asset, right? But basically we said, well, you've got to start with something. Okay. So our something was literally the, um, the, you know, returns of, of that asset. Okay. Then you start, you know, going, okay, what's the next step? What's the next step? 
Now, of course, we all know once you start building it, you're hoping, you know, that you build it and they will come. Well, they come and they come fast, right? So it's, you know, how, how fast can you go? But you have to put, do that. And what that does for you is it starts putting your structure in place. Okay. Your structure is we all buy assets differently. We all buy, you know, and let me just say, I'm not even going to say asset. Um, you know, we, we've spent time with what's a building, what's an asset, what's an investment. Okay. Like you have to go through this and figure out how you're defining these terms so that you can slice and dice. Right. And, and trust me, you're not going to do this all day one, but at least you are saying like, okay, I've got a building. I've got three buildings together. What does that mean? Right. How do I want to pull this together? And then, then it starts growing from there. So that's literally where we started. At the same time that we did that, we were trying to enhance processes. Okay. So, so we've got this data journey, but this goes back to the business process side to saying, we are tracking all of our, you know, X, Y, Z, I'm going to say dead okay, in Excel, right? That's, you know, that's what you, you're doing, Excel. And then it was all coming over and we're getting a massive file that says, here's all your debt. So wait a minute, there's got to be a way to do that better, right? I mean, there's got to be, right? So we went and, um, and put in, you know, a system to track our debt. Okay. So now, but one of the key parts about the system to track our debt is you got to be able to get that data out so it goes and matches into the data warehouse, right? And into the investment that's sitting over here. Okay. So what we did is we said, these aren't, these aren't linear. They're not, you know, they, but so one, I need to have the company work smarter, better. And I also need to get the data. Okay. So I've got a data journey that's happening. I'm building out my infrastructure at the same time that I'm trying to do things to um, help people work. Okay. And so those things, so that's to me is where you get started, which is you have to start at a specific spot in your data journey, start and then go from there. But you really do need to address people. It's hard. I mean, there's a lot, you know, and so how do you start, how do you start hitting those things and then tie them into your data journey? You know, when it's the right time to tie them in. I think that's a perfect, I think that's a perfect, yeah. I mean, it, may, it makes perfect sense and, and it's a very kind of, um, logical approach to getting started so you're not overwhelmed by the magnitude of of data you said something interesting you said you know when they build it they come you know they come fast and you know a big part of technology and innovation inside of real estate companies is the change management is adoption is utilization uh, when I talk to people, they often tell me I tried that technology and it didn't work, whether that's, you know, a competitor of ours or something unrelated. And I know many of these systems and I know that they work perfectly fine. I would say nine out of 10 times, it's the user, maybe eight out of 10 times, it's often the user or the organization versus the actual application. So inside of this massive organization, I think you said 4,500 employees, you know, 30, you know, many dozens of countries, like, how do you think about the change management? How do you bring people in? How do you get engagement so that they become a part of the solution versus an impediment to it? And it's hard also back to what I said before, we're consensus building decentralized organization. Okay. So there's, there's a lot to that, which is who can say no and who will say no and who, you know, and, and things like that. And everybody's got an opinion. I joke around that, you know, in um, the racy chart, right? Racy, responsible, accountable, consultant, inform there's no informs and hinds. You don't ever <laughs> inform somebody. Somebody's always got an opinion again, which is great about the organization. That, that's fantastic. So, so let me say this. Um, you have to have buy-in from your senior leadership that like this is something that needs to be done, right? That this is important, that data is important, that these sorts of things are important. Without that, you, you know, you're, you're dead in the water. But that buy-in doesn't actually translate to any change management, right? Uh, let's, right? It's not, at least in our organizations, there aren't mandates. Just, just somebody saying, go do this doesn't mean everybody magically you know, falls in line. And I don't even know any organization, even if they do mandate things that, that, that really happens. So, um, so, so a couple of things, and this has been, what I say is there's two levels of change management. Okay. There is a, how you approach things as an organization and then how you approach things specifically related to projects and, and things like that. So as an organization, um, Heinz, you know, 
15 years ago, whatever, was very vocal actually about not being in the forefront of new technologies and all that. Because at the time, again, there weren't that many. And it was like, well, we're not going to go, like, we'll be a second or third adopter. We're not going to be the first adopter. Because it was just, it was just hard and, and things. Um, and so number one was change that mindset within, right? And start to talk. And again, this is organizationally. Okay, we're going to start doing this. We're going to be changing this this um, mindset. We are going to be leaning in on these things, right? Another thing from an organizational perspective was that, um, so real estate, at least at Heinz, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're building buildings, right? We're doing certain things and, and they need to be right. Okay, they need to be right 100%, like building buildings, right? So what was that was translating to is anything that we we're doing or anything you're rolling out has to be perfect, okay? And perfect means every exception, every everything. Well, then you never can actually roll things out, right? And so it doesn't work or this and this, you get all those comments. And so we um, very actively started to change that mindset that's, okay, perfect can't be the enemy of good. It's totally right about building a building. It's totally right about, you know, but from an adoption of technology, we all get app updates all the time, right? And so how do you start, you know, changing that mindset that we have to address the 90% right now and, and we can't ignore the 10% of exceptions, but we've got to move, right? And if you try to do everything at once, you won't get there. So these were organizational mindset shifts that we actually have actively been working on. I mean, I'll say for, for 10 years and, and we're there, right? So leadership buy-in plus all this now if you start going to the the on the ground um it is it's really hard it's it's really really hard um and it takes constant constant repeated communication okay um what are you doing why are you doing it why it is going to benefit that user group okay and if you can't articulate why like Honestly, you shouldn't be doing it. Okay. And so, so you've got to articulate the why. Why is going to benefit. And by the way, maybe it's a short term pain, but it gets to this long term. Like you've got to articulate that because if you can't articulate that, nobody's going to, nobody's going to buy it. Right. It's still hard. Okay. But it is a constant. This helps you here and this helps the investor here. This helps you here and this helps the client here. This will give you more time to go spend talking to these folks. This will help you, you know, be able to analyze all the things for your employees better. All those things, okay, right? How it gives, what's in it for them, right? And and that's a very real thing. That's that's very very real. And the more of those things you can articulate, the easier the change management comes. But it is constant, repeated communication. I mean, that's the. There's no secret sauce other than other than that. I like it. Constant, repeated communication. I uh, or I have a mug here, and this is the the joke is that herding cats is what I do because it's just that's what you you've got to at least in, again in our organization that you know people just aren't people aren't just going to roll. I mean they're not going to be like yeah. So so to me, if you do that and work through it and talk about hey, I know it's not going to be perfect on day one, but it's going to do these ten things. So you can get those 12 things later. They're more apt to not say, oh, this sucks. This doesn't work. This doesn't this, this is this. Because it's also expectation management, right? Like constant repeated communication is about expectation management. Yeah, I mean, I think it highlights the evolving role of people who exist to transform and change businesses. And we operate in an industry that is historically as you just mentioned, not wanted to be at the leading end, the tip of the spear. And that's okay. But now we're in the kind of the fat part of the curve where change is a requirement. So to not change, by definition, you're stagnating and falling behind. And so this is, you know, what you're doing, what some of your peers are doing is just a fundamentally new set of skills inside of these companies. I think it's really, really fascinating. And, and again, and I'm exceptionally lucky. I'm in an organization that change is a part of the culture as well, right? I mean, so so when I'm saying that getting past some of these organizational things, I mean, it's about the data and the, you know, leading and about um, doesn't have to be perfect. I don't have to get past the change and innovation idea. I mean, that's actually sometimes going even faster than we can even try to corral it here, right? And so um, we are, that's our mentality. And um, so we're lucky that we don't have to deal with that, right? But I think other companies have to 
have to deal with that as well. Why do I have to change it all? Right? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to? And that's that's just different than than our DNA. Yeah. Well, speaking of change, I think one of the other things that is changing or that you're trying to change is the way the real estate industry looks, right? You know, the diversity of our industry, the accessibility of roles within the industry. Talk to me a little bit about kind of what you're doing around some of these initiatives and kind of what, you know, goals or, or kind of aspirations you have that our listeners can, can you know, be a part of or, or help better understand to, to, to be able to support as, as allies or, or even on, um, you know, on the front lines with you. Uh, well, thank you for teaming that up because, you know, Brandon, you know, this is near and dear to my heart. So I am going to make one correction there. It's not necessarily about how it looks. Okay. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm using that very specifically because and what I want to talk about and what I've consistently talked about is diversity in thought. Okay. And, and if it, and it ties back actually to what I was saying, one of the reasons, you know, I'm at Heinz is because you're always learning, you're always listening, you're always, you know, from kind of all these other people. So to me, that we need, I mean, we need to listen to other voices. We need to hear from other voices. We need to learn from other people that aren't, that don't look like us, that don't, sound like us that don't come from the same background as us, you know, whatever it is. Okay. Um, I am hugely passionate about that. Um, everybody brings something to the table, right? Everybody. Okay. And we need to be listening to that and say, okay, well, how does that weave into, you know, the, anything that we do, right? I mean, anything, your daily lives. Right. And so, um, I am, I am actively, <laughs> You know, for anybody who's seen my millions of posts on LinkedIn, you know, trying to talk about this more in the real estate industry and in the real estate tech industry specifically, because um, that's not known for uh, diversity. Okay. Or I'm going to say diversity of thought because, because maybe it is because of how people look and who people have come from and people have all been kind of this, you know, one type of, of, of um, view. So I, have been doing a lot of work just in general at Heinz for probably about five, six, seven years. Okay. Because Heinz is always, we've always been kind of talking about that, but really pushed it starting in 2000, 2016 and did some grassroots efforts and, and some things there. Um, but now I'm really expanding it outside of Heinz and really having some discussions about that in every conference, you know, in every place that I can about how do we bring all that diversity of thought into play and really talk about that and really understand where people are coming from and what can we learn from what people are coming from so that we can change, you know, about how we, how we do things. So that, that's, uh, that's at least a start of, of what I'm doing. And what is, you know, what is specific kind of success metrics look like for you in the near term? I know you've, you've been championing the internal initiatives at Heinz, but externally when we're at conferences, when we're engaging with our peers in the technology industry or just the real estate kind of built environment, what should we be looking for? What should we be thinking about? Like how, how do we effectuate bringing that diversity of thought to the table? Where does it start? Like what's, you know. So um, I inherently am a pretty open <laughs> talk to the person, right? Uh, if you can tell, right? You know that, Brandon. So, uh, so to me, the, the way to effectuate change here is talking to people about who they are. Okay. And so the theme that you'll see across some things that, that we've been doing recently, whether it was at Realcom, um, you're going to kind of see some things, um, potentially at, at Cretech we're, we're working on whether it's related to, I did a real time webinar, I'm doing some other things with some other organizations. It's, it's about talking about where you come from and, and who you are and bringing that authentic, authenticity and being this genuine person who bring that to the table. Okay. Um, and I think that for years and years and years, especially in the real estate industry, that wasn't, don't do that. Right. Don't, don't bring pictures of your kids. Don't, talk about your stuff or, you know, now, of course, a lot of that's changed now, but, but we all remember time of that. Right. And, um, and how can you have, like, we have to break down those barriers and be talking about who we are and talking about our differences so that you can then learn from them. Okay. So that's to me how we effectuate change. And, and, um, 
and not and not being scared by that, right? And not being and, and so um to me, how do we mark progress? When you see those dialogues happening in a more natural, fundamental way, okay? And that it's it's just organic and it's you know, not I have to go have a breakfast to have that conversation or I have to go this. So to me is how that intrinsically becomes more part of the the ecosystem and the, and the fabric. So uh, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but it's um, it's to me the only way that we, we can get started. Yeah, well, I agree. And I appreciate everything that you're doing for the industry. And um, I love the kind of quote unquote real talk uh, tagline that, you know, wh whether it sticks or, or it's temporary, I think it, it really hits on um, the, at the core of, of what needs to happen. Um, and, and, you know, I think many of us share your beliefs about um, just being authentic. And as you've said many times throughout this discussion, bringing, you know, feeling safe to, to bring your best self to work and, and being your authentic self. So um, I appreciate the, the work that you're doing. And I know, you know, your, your colleagues in the industry uh, do as well. Um, we have just a few more minutes before we wrap up. Just, just kind of, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting um, is that, you know, you're not necessarily focused on the market dynamics and is it going to go up or down, but you're impacted by it and you might be focused on it, but you oh, know, it, it, <laughs> you we're all focused on it. You know, how, how do you think, and I know you and I have discussed this in the past, like, how do you think about the kind of the gyrations of the market? And again, this is August, 2023, and there's been many and the impact that that has on kind of the technology or innovation adoption curve so it's interesting uh, when all of this started happening with the markets and uh we were seeing what's happening back in and towards the end of last year we had we were having some leadership meetings here at heinz and i made a comment and i said uh if our real estate folks our transaction folks and they've got slow down the only thing that's going to happen is they're going to look inward to do a lot of these projects and a lot of these things and all that. So it was going to explode. Okay. Um, so from a Heinz perspective, that happened. There was no doubt about it. So the markets slowing down caused a lot of inward. Okay. Let's go, go, go faster, go faster, which, which it is great. Okay. It's, you know, a little bit of, of, uh, overwhelming at times, but it, but it's, but it's, but it's absolutely great because that's like, that's some great, great momentum. Um, it's also interesting when the market's slowing down and, and everything that's kind of been happening is that, um, it's putting pressure again to, to innovate. It's putting pressure to do things better and faster and easier. So it's, you know, accelerating people that are already on this journey or really starting people to get on this, on this journey if they, if they weren't already. Um, the counterbalance to that though is also the funding to be able to do that. Okay. So it's a really strange time. Okay. By the way, I do talk with my hands. I talk with my hands the entire time here. So that's, hopefully that's okay. Um, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a strange time, right? Because the, the industry wants to push, people want to push, but yet the industry isn't having the, uh, the transactions and the flow and things like that in the market to, to fund all of this as much as it, as it could or should. Um, and so I think we're all just watching this and saying, okay, we have to be really smart about what we're doing, putting our time and our resources in the right places. goes back to what I said at the beginning. What's the X and Y access and ROI and ease of adoption and kind of get some things out there. Or maybe it's not ease of adoption, but it's ROI, uh, you know, and, and like I'm referencing carbon and ESG related things specifically. They're not easy to adopt, but, you know, we all believe that there's a high ROI. And so, um, so it's really about ensuring that, that what you're doing matters. Okay. And gives you the most bang for your buck. So it's kind of goes back to that original, original statement. Yeah, I think I think I think that makes a lot of sense, and it's and it's kind of counterintuitive that as you know the market's slow and people look internally to create operational leverage and operational efficiency. By the way, we talked about that on a past episode with Taylor Manman from RCLCO, who's a pension fund and you know investor consultant. He talked about the importance of operational leverage in this environment, and so as organizations look internally to you and your team, you have to be able to fund these initiatives as well. And so I think for any you know 
uh, folks listening who control the funding, that's an important connection to make. And there's kind of an inverse correlation to market, you know, uh, velocity uh, to technology innovation. So thanks for thanks for calling that out. Well, Eileen, we're, we're just about at the end of time. I've, I've enjoyed the conversation. Um, before we conclude, I always like to uh, ask guests, you know, for anybody who wants to learn more about your work, learn more about Heinz, connect with you, what's the best way for them to reach you, follow you, connect? Uh, through LinkedIn is probably, is, is probably the best way. Um, I'm, for being in my role, I am slightly overwhelmed by technology right now. <laughs> so um, the fact that anybody can get to you on a million different channels is slightly overwhelming. But uh, I think LinkedIn is the best way. This is the best way to do it. Awesome. Well, Eileen, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, and I look forward to uh, many more in the future. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's fun. <laughs>